All right. Well, we've got some big news this week, so it was a good week to come out and to be a part of our services. Last week, we told you about all the developments on this campus and, and um, what we've got coming down the pipe. There's, there was a lot of uncertainty about our future, especially at this location. Uh, the plan has been, as I've revealed to you, the plan has been that as the lease agreement uh, ends this week that Hoffman House has with, this, uh, with the owners here, that we were planning to continue to rent from the actual owners, that we were just going to change the name of the, you know, on top of the check. Say, okay, we did this with them. Let's do that now with you guys, with the owners, as you continue to search out a tenant to uh, take on the restaurant, the bar facility, and oversight of uh, a banquet facility. And he was really excited. I mean, he was like, this is going to be great because basically I can pitch this building with a recurring rental that I could find a tenant and tell them every week, you're going to have a group in there Sunday mornings, and this is what it's going to look like, and that'll help you out big time. And so that was our plan, and we were working toward that and very excited about it. And as we tried to finalize details on that, okay, let's get together, let's put this in writing, let's make sure we're all tracking together. And so uh, earlier this month, that was a meeting that I had. Here's the, the numbers that we presently do. Here's what we hope that would look like. Here's the stipulations we're going to put on it. Don't, don't do a week-to-week thing. I don't want to get a phone call. Hey, Cor, I'm sorry. You guys have to be out this weekend, find a new location. I was like, give us, you know, give us a, a long runway if things are going to ever change. And so it was looking pretty good, but then I got together with him this week, and he said, ah, we, we looked at the numbers, I talked to my dad and brother, and we're just not interested. And yeah, so kick in the gut. And for me, I was so angry at first and disappointed. Like, are you serious? You're going to walk away from this good money that we're willing to give you guys each week. Like, how crazy are you? Um, but it, to be honest, God is on the move. And um, the decision was, in a way, made for us. And so now we get to look ahead into the future. We've been making plans all along. We've known this was coming. And so uh, we're, we're making arrangements. So here's the, here, here's the first phase of this new arrangement. Throughout the course of June, we are going to meet at Williams Tree Farm. It's out in Rockton, Illinois. My parents' tree farm out there. We're doing camp out there. We set up for uh, church stuff out there before. We did our Christmas Eve service out there. And we had the most guests we've ever had was our Christmas Eve services. So we're going to go out there for the month of June. Uh, that's our temporary landing point. That's where we're going to be just for a little bit. And we're going to spend the next month then, my dad, who's one of the elders, Bruce, who's one of the elders, we're going to be getting together and just revisiting everything, just looking at all the, the options that we have, all the potentials that are in front of us as a campus for where we will land. Um, and then, uh, hopefully July, the first weekend in July, we will be at our new location in McChesney Park, Lord willing. Now, the place that we have visited, have spent some time in, um, have toured, and really like and could see working out pretty easily is actually the high school. And so on June 7th, we're going to head over to Harlem High School. It's a Thursday evening, and we're going to do a preview night. And here's what I'd love for you to do. I know it's very short notice, but if you can maneuver your schedule to allow you to be there, we'd love for you to come out. Because the plan is, we're not going to sign a contract. We're not going to agree to anything until you guys have the opportunity to, to get in there, prayerfully consider what that might look like for us as a church family, and then, um, and then agree. This is, this is our new home. And so we're going to head over there. We're going to have a time of worship, a time of prayer, a time of casting vision, and and getting into the Word and just looking at where God is taking us as a church family. So, I'm excited. A few days ago, I was angry, but God is doing something here. So, let me just share with you a few different items that make me pretty thrilled with what's happening. The first one is God's on the move. Uh, my, my personal devotions over the last week, God has rehearsed to me over and over again, I got this. And He is not surprised, and He keeps reminding me of what He is up to, and I had a plan, but that's trashed. So his plan is the new one, and it's a lot better. So I'm just excited about where, where we're going as a church. I feel like God's on the move, and I, and I uh, now have a vision for how that could even be better for us in the long run. The other thing is we look at these other facilities and potentials in front of us. There's a lot of opportunity. Um, right now, our kids' ministry is bursting at the seams, so we would have to address that regardless. But as we look at, let's say, Harlem High School and some of the other locations, there's a lot of square footage with a lot of potential to reach uh, more, more families in this community and be able to serve them in a way that's, that's better and, and more effective for drop-off and pick-up and just appropriate spaces for our young people. So we're excited about that. I love the fact that it, it feels like we're making decisions that are very um, financially just trying to pay attention to. How can we 
advance the mission that God has us on and do that in a very cost-effective way. And this whole process feels like an opportunity to do that very well. And then the other thing that I'm super thrilled on is the fact that we set out from day one to reach the McChesney Park community. Being homeless, if you will, being a, a missionary people of God without a permanent facility makes that an issue every single week. We keep reminding ourselves we're here to reach the lost. We're here to minister to this community. And, and being in this arrangement forces us to keep pressing on that issue. We want to reach McChesney Park. Wherever we land next will not be out of convenience. It'll be out of mission. We'll be saying, this is where God is calling us to as a church family in order to serve and, and reach more people uh, with the good news of his gospel. So if you're like me, and this is the first time that you've heard this, you, you, you probably have a whole bunch of things going on inside you right now. Um, so what I want to do now is take you into the Word and just share with you some lessons that I'm learning about this process. So if you can, get a Bible and get with me to Numbers chapter 10. It would be on page 115 in the blue Bibles that we have here. And I'm going to walk you through a huge section of Scripture, just highlighting these major lessons that I think we each need to be learning as we go through this thing together. So page 115 in the Bibles we have here. Now I'm going to pray once more, and then we'll get after it. Lord, we ask right now as we open up your word that you would minister to us, that your voice would come through loud and clear, and we would be steadied, that your, your word would help us to, to recognize what you're doing, and then, Lord, to be, to be able to march out in faith into the unknown. And so, Lord, we just pray over our time right now in your word, and we ask for your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lesson number one, we are a portable people. We are the portable people of God. If you're looking at chapter 10 toward the end, toward the end there, verses 33 and following, it's, it's addressing the people of God as they're about to march out and, and travel wherever God leads them. Um, in fact, you can read verse 33. It says, So they set out from the mountain of the Lord, and they traveled for three days. The Ark of the Covenant went before them during those three days to find them a place to rest. God is leading his people out into the desert wilderness, they're, they're at the, the bottom of Mount Sinai. He's, he's leading them now into this preferred future that he has for them. And, and they're having to travel. And if you've, if you've read the story about the people of God, they, they have to develop an elaborate system for being on the move and being able to set up church and, and being portable. But that's who they are. That's a feature of the people of God. They are a portable people. God looks at them and he says, let's go. Let's go. And he leads them wherever. Now that concept doesn't just drop away when they actually get to do the brick and mortar temple. Uh, it doesn't just go away. In fact, it's maintained throughout all of scripture. The, the church has that status as well. In 1 Peter, it talks about us, the church, being a people of sojourners, uh, a people who are traveling, a people who don't have a permanent residence in a location, but actually are citizens of a heavenly city. And so wherever we go, we go as the missionary people of God, as the sojourners, as strangers and exiles, and we might post up in one location for a long, long time, an entire lifetime even, but ultimately our destination is, is a city, is a place that God himself is the builder and maker. And so that's who we are, and, and that's an important lesson for us to, to learn. And as we head out into the unknown and we go to the tree farm for a bit and go wherever, Harlem, wherever, next, we just keep reminding ourselves we are the portable people of God. And the building doesn't define us. It's the mission that defines us. God has called us together to be on mission together. Um, that, that's a hard lesson to learn, but I think we're going to learn it the hard way. And we're going to be traveling around doing our thing. And I guess as I was reflecting on it, I was just thinking, you know what? If given the option to spend money on a building or to spend money investing in making disciples who can make disciples, uh, that's my preference. I would love to invest the resources that we have not in a brick and mortar facility necessarily, but in people and other people who can just minister and just keep, keep this thing going. I mean, honestly, a building doesn't do ministry. People do. And so we need a place to meet, but ultimately we want to be on the mission together with God. We want our resources even to reflect that. So lesson number one, we are the portable people of God. Lesson number two, not so fun one, but it's true. We're prone to complain. We're prone to complain. Look at chapter 11. What happens next so they march out, and we, you know, end of chapter 10, right into chapter 11, right away people are complaining. Now, I was having a hard time with this. I was like, you know what? The, what I should probably do 
is spend our Sunday rolling out this plan and just being as positive as I possibly can. Just telling you guys why I feel like God is doing this, leading this thing out, helping you to kind of get on board. Why should I spend time being negative? A lot of these things, the lessons are kind of negative. And then I realized, oh, we won't make it to next weekend if we don't start to address this. Look, it took three days. We, we won't make it to next weekend before we start to grumble and complain. So we just need to be aware we're, we are prone to complain. Chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So the place was called Teberah because fire from the Lord had, had burned among them. So they didn't make it three days before they start complaining about the scenario. And here's, here's the essence of their complaint. They were looking at their situation and they were looking at how they were being led by the, the Spirit of God and marching out into the desert. And they were looking at the provision that God was giving to them. And they actually began to reinterpret their previous experience as better. Egypt was better. And here's how they put it. Look at verses five and six. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, garlic, but now we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna, a bread that they would wake up in the morning and it'd be covering the ground and they'd gather enough for the day and they'd eat this bread that was God's daily provision for them, their daily bread. And now they're getting to a point where they're saying, this is all we ever eat and I miss that variety. I love, right, my favorite meal is breakfast in the evening because I love a little bit of scrambled eggs, a little bit of bacon, a little bit of potatoes O'Brien, a little bit of pancakes, a little bit of, you know, cinnamon rolls, a little bit of everything, a little bit of orange juice. I love the variety. So I understand as they look at this, they go, what's the deal? All we ever eat is this manna. But the complaint then is saying, God, your provision is not good enough. And we begin to reinterpret the, the comforts of familiarity and just say, that is our preference now, I'm going to be careful here because I'm not saying the Beloit campus is slavery in Egypt, right? Those of you that came with us, uh, you know what? That was a lot better. And, you know, Egypt, oh, that was awesome. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying if you transferred from another church experience, that's, a, that's slavery in Egypt. Here's all, I'm, all, all that I'm saying is what we have a tendency to do in our complaints is to say, I don't know if I like the provision God is giving me. I prefer something that's easier, something that's more comfortable, something that's more familiar. And we just have to be careful of that because when we complain, it is sin. When we complain, what we're doing is we're grumbling against the God who is giving us everything that we need. We're, we're, it's actually an assault. Grumbling is actually an assault on God's provision and care. When you're complaining, you're saying, God, you are not doing your job. You're not taking care of us. You're not giving us what we need. And, and so here's what I'm trying to warn my own heart against and, and ask you to do the same thing. Be careful of looking at the provision that God gives you, the weekly, the daily provision. Be careful that you don't begin to despise that. So if God says, I'm giving you the tree farm for a month, and we go, okay, that's great, but that's not a, that's not a permanent solution. Don't despise the provision God has given to you. Don't despise, if he says, hey, we're going to be here for a short season in a new location, don't despise the provision and look back longingly on, well, man, I miss that comfort, I miss that familiarity, I miss the, the, all the benefits of just being in a location permanently. So let's be careful about complaining. Um, the thing that happens here is the people complain and then the leaders complain. Moses begins to complain in verses 10 through 13. He begins to grumble because the people are grumbling. God, why'd you call me to these stubborn people? Why'd you give me such a diff difficult group to lead? And so we have to be careful because complaining is contagious. When people start complaining, it just becomes this avalanche of, I'm upset, then other people are upset. And you know that to be true in your workplaces. You know that to be true in your families. Complaining is contagious. So here's what we need to do. We're just going to cut it off. It's not going to be something we tolerate around here. As we go into this unknown future, we're not going to sit around and gripe and grumble and complain. And we're not, going to, we're not going to put up with that. We're going to trust the provisions enough. And God's on the move, and we're going to go with him. And we're not going to sit around and, and, and gripe about it. Now, an interesting thing here is one of the strategies 
that God uses to deal with complaining is he multiplies leaders. If you look at the, the story, 70 elders get anointed to, to share in the leadership calling with Moses. And it's a really beautiful story, but that's one of the things we're trying to do around here. Multiply leaders. Uh, we've got around 20 different people who are in um, leadership positions on key ministry teams, and we just want to keep just expanding that thing out because leadership is the place where the leaders need to be leading with joy in anticipation of what God is doing so that there's less of a chance that, that we're all grumbling and complaining. Um, and so, again, we're just not going to complain around here. We're going to trust God. We're going to march forward in faith, and uh, complaining is not going to be something that we, that we tolerate around here. But that's a lesson. We are prone to complain. Here's the third lesson. We're prone to oppose leadership. Look with me at chapter 12 now. Um, we have this episode where, the, where leadership is in question. Now, again, there's 70 elders, there's Moses and Aaron and Miriam and others. There's a bunch of people in key leadership positions. But now what we find is people are getting upset with how things are happening and with the leaders who are on the top. And so in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12, it says, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this and was not pleased. He was upset with the way that they were speaking against Moses and questioning his leadership authority. Now, here's what they were doing, and I, I want to acknowledge that they, they had some things going on that I think were right and appropriate. They were actually applying some principles from Scripture, and they were trying to do it uh, in a way that was unhelpful. Here's, here's one of the principles. They, they recognized the Israelites are called to be different. They're called to be holy. They're called to be the people of God. They're, they're supposed to be separate. And so when, uh, when Moses marries a Cushite woman, they're saying, I don't know if that's a great idea because then we're intermingling with this other culture and it could be problematic long-term. And so they're, they're addressing that. Another thing that they're pointing out is um, the priesthood of all believers, that Moses is a leader and he's able to communicate with God, but isn't that something that God offered the entire nation? In Exodus chapter 19, God said to the entire group, you're my special treasured possession and you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. In other words, he said, everybody who's a part of this community can communicate with God. And so now they're taking that truth and they're going, look, we can talk to God. Why, why does Moses have this privileged position? Well, is he the only prophet? Is he the only one who hears from God? Certainly God speaks to us as well. And so they're taking those two different truths and they're misapplying them. And here's, here's actually what they're doing. Because of their envy and because they imagine that they could do a better job than Moses, they're taking the Bible and they're using it in an unhelpful way and they're, they're becoming legalists. They're taking the Bible and they're saying, this is what I think is true and if you're not willing to do it, you're in the wrong. This is what I think is true. You shouldn't have married a Cushite woman. You should not have married a woman who wasn't a part of our nation. And so you're in the wrong. And because of that, you really are forfeiting your right to be our leader. And we have to be careful about that because we can take good and important biblical truths. And when we begin to resent leadership, we will use that as a weapon to do harm in that community. We'll say, this is what ought to be happening. And it's a problem that the leaders aren't doing it. And so we're going to cause trouble and they really shouldn't even be leaders. So we have to be careful here because we're prone to oppose our leaders. And, and it shows up when, I was thinking through this, it shows up when you're sitting around going, should have been done like that. And you begin to think of a different way to carry out the plan. And you think, oh, we should have done it this way. And then you begin to think, I could probably do a better job. And honestly, I'll give that to you. I'm going to show you here in a minute most of you probably could do a better job of leading this project than I could. So that's the qualification I want to give you here. I'm in way over my head. The stuff that I'm doing nowadays, it's all new to me. It's stuff I've never, ever done before. I've never sat around and crunched numbers on commercial real estate. I've never looked at a, a multi-million dollar loan. Like, I, never in my life have I sat around going, I wonder what it would cost to have a 30-year note on a multi-million dollar facility. That's all new to me. I've never looked at the, the term agreements of a, of a triple net lease. I've never done that before. I've never called and worked with commercial real estate agents before. I've never done any of this stuff that I've been doing nowadays. I've never worked with a, with a board of a school to draw up a contract with them. I've never done these things before. 
I've also never led a, a division of an organization that has to make decisions, but also has to keep in lockstep with the entire organization and, um, and keep the alignment and everything going. The multi-site thing, where, where I'm a campus pastor here making decisions for us and for our future and trying to figure out how does that work while maintaining alignment and health and, and running things up the decision-making process at the Beloit campus with our senior leaders there and our elder board there. I've never done that before. And it's harder than it, it sounds hard, right? It's even harder than it sounds. So this is all new to me. Also, I've never led a congregation with former pastors in it, okay? People who have more training than me, more experience than me, uh, more, more skill sets than I do, and we have three of them, okay? So I've never done this before, and I feel in way over my head, and most of you are incredibly mature too. I was, I was thinking about this, you know, I could blindfold myself right now, spin around a few times, throw a ball out, and whoever catches it could probably do as good of a job as, as I'm doing, right? We have incredibly gifted and talented people in our church family. And so all of this is very, very new to me. There are things that I've never done before. And, and actually, I'd be concerned for you if you didn't have some questions about my leadership. Um, but let's, let's look at this again. Here's the principle. We're prone to oppose our leaders. And what they were doing was they were saying, he married a Cushite. He should not have done that. And we can, we can talk to God. We should be the leaders. So I want to warn you. And it's strange for me as the leader to try to push on this agenda a little bit, but I just want to warn our, ourselves about um, taking matters, taking decisions that are debatable, okay? The marrying a Cushite, which by the way, I'll never do that, um, <laughs> but, a, but a debatable matter, a decision that Moses made, and they're saying, this is a problem. And I just want us to be careful that we don't create resentment in our own hearts when debatable decisions are made, and they don't go the way we think they should, and then we begin to resent and oppose the leadership. Let's just be very gracious. I know, again, it's weird. I'm saying it. Be gracious to me, please. You know, just give me, give me a lot of slack and a lot of leeway to make some mistakes because I'm sure I'm going to make a lot of them. Um, but, but one of the lessons we need to learn is we have a tendency to oppose leadership, and so we have to guard our hearts against that, especially in the days ahead. As decisions are being made, and we'll do everything we can to involve you as much as possible, but certain things will have to be decided uh, on ministry teams and with our board and, and, and with our elders. And, and so um, I hope that you can just get on board with it and be okay. So the fourth lesson I want to show you here is that we're likely to evaluate without faith. Look with me now at chapters 13 and 14. Here's what's going on. They send out people to explore the land that they're called to go into. They send out a team of people to make an evaluation of the land. Um, verses 1 and 2, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. Skip down to verses 17 and following. When, when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How's the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? And do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grape. So they were given a mission. Go and, and make an assessment. Go and make an evaluation of the land. Bring back a report about this place that we're called to go into. And it's fascinating because they come back and, and the, the group is divided. The majority of them are looking at the land and their report is identical. Same facts. Here's what it's like. It's amazing. It, it is lush. It is a pleasant place. It, it has these cities that are fortified and tremendous armies and all these different things. It's a beautiful location. Both groups say that, but one says, therefore, we ought to go in. The, one group interprets all of that and says, if God's for us, we're going in. But the other group says, we should not go in. Those people are enormous, and we look like shrimps compared to them. We just look like grasshoppers in their eyes. We, we have no chance here. And so they both evaluate the same scenario, but the way that they come back, the, the report is very different. One says, yes, it's great, but here's why it won't work. And the other group of two people, they're able to say, no, we should go. 
Look with me at verse 30. Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. This is the individual who has faith, who looks at it and says, God is calling us here, and we're going to do it. But verses 31 and following, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. Okay, here's the lesson again. When we evaluate things, we're prone to do it without faith. So we look at a scenario and we kind of figure out, okay, what does that mean for us? What does that look like for us? And we have a tendency not to, not to allow faith to be the intangible X factor. Like, yes, all these details are true, but if God is calling us here, then, then we're going to be okay. Let me, let me share with you how this showed up in my own heart. I'll put myself on blast here. So we go, to, we go to Harlem High School, and we bring our team over there, and we're looking at it. And it's like, yeah, this place is pretty killer. Like, this is a big building. And we go in the auditorium, and our band members and our tech people are like foaming at the mouth like, this will be so wonderful. They're looking at the stage, and they're looking at all the things that they have in there, and they're going, yes, please, this is, this is going to be awesome. We look at the area for the kids, and we look at classroom space, and we go, man, we build our walls out there with carts and um, fencing. That's a lot of work. We could use real walls, and our kids, could, we could put them in a classroom, and they could be in a classroom, and we wouldn't have a kid just push it down. And like, that sounds great. That's wonderful. And all these different things. And we think, you know what? The cost is right. The square footage is insane. What we would get out of this is tremendous. But here's what I start doing. But the entryway is really long. And it is. It's like stupid long. Like you walk in and I was like, what is this going to look like for a first time visitor? So someone opens the door. Hey, how are you doing this morning? And then all of a sudden you've got this gauntlet. It's like, okay, what do we do here? Do we just line it with people? So you're like, hello, hello, good morning. You know, and you just march down. Or do you put somebody at the end and you just like, like they either wave at you for 45 seconds or they just, you know, pretend until you get up close. Oh, hey. So I'm like, that would be weird. How do we address that? And then where the classrooms are is not very close to the auditorium. So we'd have to figure out a game plan, a map for how do we get parents checked in and the kids checked in and then over to the auditorium and not lose them in that giant facility. Like, how do we do this? And so I'm giving all of these different, yeah, it's great, but, and I can explain why there's going to be some challenges there. What I'm doing there is I'm evaluating without faith. Now, the details are all important. That was the point of sending out the explorers in the first place. You need to know what you're going into. You need to know how big the armies are and, and what's ahead of you and what you have to go in and, and to do. But keep in mind the intangible X factor, God is on your side. So when, whenever we look at a building now, that's going to be another category in consideration. What are the details of it? What is God calling us to do? Because if God is calling us there, no matter how challenging it might be, if God is calling us there, we're going to be okay. And he's going to provide for us, and those details will be sorted out along the way. So the lesson again is that we are likely to evaluate without faith, but we want to be a people who, as we're making our decisions now, we're keeping in mind God is on the move. He's called us to this, and he will provide richly for us. Here's the fifth and final lesson for us. We desperately need the gospel. It shows up here over and over again. In fact, there's a pattern that's emerged. It's unbelief in the people of God. They think, this, they complain. And they say, God, I, I, don't, I don't like this provision. There's unbelief there. Um, there's unbelief in the leadership. I don't know if the leaders are doing a great job. There's unbelief in, in uh, whether or not they can actually get into the city. There's all these expressions of unbelief, this pattern over and over again. And here's what happens next. There's a prayer for the people. There's somebody interceding on their behalf. Yes, God, they lack faith in you and what you're doing. They lack faith in, in your goodness and your kindness and your ability to provide. And there's an inner, somebody praying for them. Moses, in most cases, is praying for the people of God. And then God, because of that prayer and because of his willingness to atone for our unbelief, pardons the people and gives them undeserved, unmerited favor. That's the gospel. That's exactly the message that Christianity is all about. It's about an unbelieving people like you and me who often look at God and say, I don't believe that. I can't follow that. I don't buy into that. I don't trust that. 
And, and there's one who's praying for us. And there's a pardon for our unbelief, a pardon for our sin, and God showering on us undeserved, unmerited favor. Now, I'm going to show it to you here in chapter 14. Uh, and, and you can just think back about the other episodes. But in chapter 14, Moses, the, the people are saying, we can't go in. It would not even be smart for us to go in. We're going to get torched. And, um, and so because of their unbelief, the anger of the Lord was burning against them. And Moses prays. He intercedes for them. Look with me briefly at uh, chap- chapter 14, verses 17 and following. And this is, this is Moses praying. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, again, he's praying to God, in accordance with your great love, God, forgive the sin of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. He's praying that they would experience the grace of God. He's praying that they would experience forgiveness. And do you know what God says? Amen. They are forgiven. God is able to pardon this people and to give them this this future together. They don't do a great job. In fact, even at the end of 14, they say, we screwed up. Let's just go in now. And Moses said, that ship has sailed. I'm sorry, but you should not go in now. God's not going with you, and they they get destroyed. Uh, But what I'm saying is, we, this is the lesson, we need the gospel. Sometimes we read the Old Testament, and we look at the Israelites, and we're like, those guys were dopes. Like, we, we would do such a better job at this, wouldn't we? No. We're cut from the same cloth. This is our story. We do the same thing. Often we do not believe God, but here's what we need then. We need the gospel. We need to know that Jesus is living ever to intercede on our behalf. behalf. He is praying for us, and he is offering us forgiveness and pardon. And the way that we get to experience that is because he took on himself the punishment for our unbelief. Jesus was willing to pay the penalty at the cross so that, so that the wrath of God could be exhausted on him and we could be freely forgiven and children of God. And so that's what we need. We need to rehearse the gospel to ourselves over and over and over again so that we, whatever decisions are made, whatever location we end up in, whatever the future looks like for this congregation here, we, we want to be able to say we're gospel people. Wherever we're at, we're gospel people. We're people who've been forgiven by God. We have a right relationship with God because of his grace and his mercy and what he did for us at the cross. We're okay. And so I'm going to invite the band to come up here in just a moment. But my prayer this week has been that we wouldn't lose very many of you. Now, I know if some of you, you don't have that capacity for change and, you know, this might stress you out a little bit. And maybe for the sake of your family and your own soul, going to the Beloit campus or back to another church might feel like the better fit for you. But I've been praying that most of us in here, hearing the news about our unclear future, you you would actually be excited. And you'd say, I'm in. This is my church family. This is what God has called me to. We know God is going to provide. We're not going to complain along the way. We're going to trust leaders as we make decisions. And we're just going to get after this thing. God is on the move and, and we trust him. And so that's been my prayer for you guys. So you right now, the band's going to get all set. And, um, and I hope that you're in. And I'm excited about this. So I hope you'll join us. Lord, right now, I pray for your ministry to us, Lord. I pray that you would be encouraging and inspiring our hearts right now. It is scary and it is inconvenient. Lord, we're going to commute to, we're going to, commute to community for a little bit. We're going to go out to Rockton and we know how challenging that might be for people who are coming from Rockford or McChesney Park. And then when we head back, it's going to be a commute in the other direction. So Lord, we just ask that you would help every person in here as they prayerfully reflect on where you are leading them. We ask God that if you call them to be a part of this, that you would strengthen them and sustain them and give them an excitement and an anticipation of what you're going to do in this church. In Jesus' name, amen.